because the story is extraordinary enough that it needs more evidence. And yet, there are entire religious organizations that have built their beliefs on less compelling evidence. Take those alien abduction stories, write them up, and come back in a couple thousand years where you have a history of people believing them and some scraps from the originals, or no, sorry, not from the originals, some scraps from some of the old texts where you have no originals, no known authors, you have no reason to think that, that any of these people are eyewitnesses, let alone the fact that eyewitness testimony is notoriously horrible, horrible with respect to reliability. And you've got copies of copies of translations of copies passed down this entire time, but that's good enough because it's Jesus. Why? Well, but I've had these personal experiences. I have witnessed miracles. Jesus has done amazing things for me. Uh, maybe amazing things have happened for you, but how did you come to the conclusion that it was Jesus who did these amazing things for you? Where is your evidence that connects your explanation to the event? If the chief complaint is not tied directly to what has been said, then that's just posturing. So I'll have people comment on various videos or whatever and say, oh, Matt might be good on the God issue, but he's terrible on this, 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 or this, you know. And, and they'll use language uh, that, that's obnoxious and annoying, but I ask them all the same question. What is my position that you disagree with, and why do you think it's wrong? Nobody's ever even gotten the first one right. Instead, they will saddle me with somebody else's position or something they heard or something that they have interpreted based on their own confusion about what was said. And if we can't get past, we've lost sight of nuance. And it's, if you sometimes say anything that is even vaguely in opposition to somebody's position, you become immediately the worst thing ever. And if we are going to shelter uh, medieval, harmful, misogynistic thought as if, well, we can't criticize that because that would be racist. I don't know how you can possibly criticize anything at that point. Now, you say that faith is gullibility, mm -hmm. yet everyone has faith in something. No, they don't. Including yourselves. No, they don't. I disagree, sir. I'm Everybody gonna, has faith in well, something. Well, you can disagree all day long, but I'm going to tell you what I mean by faith and why I don't have it. Faith is the excuse people give for believing in something when they don't have a good reason. If you have a good reason to believe in something, you don't need to make appeals to faith. Well, saying to have a good reason, that is an opinion, I believe. Um, well, if you say, see, I have a good reason to believe in this, that's your opinion. I might think differently. Yes, of course so, you could. But you could also be wrong. Yes, and so could you. Correct. The thing. So how do we go about determining which of us is actually right? Well, that's my question. You, you say that... The faith of a of a theist is gullibility. Yes. Yet well, no, 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 not the faith of a theist. I just say faith is gullibility. Doesn't doesn't mean it applies to theists. There are people who have faith in things like psychic healers and homeopathy and all sorts of other things, and that's also gullibility. And it is countered by education and an appeal to actually good, demonstrable standards of evidence. So I mentioned taking a look at what the Bible actually says versus what it's intended to mean versus what believers take from it. So there's, the Bible may say, you know, bring my enemies before me and let me slaughter them. And it literally says this in the modern English translations. What was the passage intended to mean? What, what context is there? Is this in fact a parable? These are questions that we have to ask, but we also have to ask, how has this been traditionally viewed? Because while it may say, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, if the bulk of Christians view that as sort of an advice to stay away from people who are engaged in witchcraft and not an actual order to kill witches, we have to take that into consideration. It's, at once upon a time during the Salem witch trials, it might have been worthwhile to launch an objection to thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. In modern times, it really doesn't have that much impact. During the entire time that I was a believer, never once would it have occurred to me to get together all my friends and stone a witch, even though that's specifically in the Bible. And that's the point that perhaps you should be objecting to. Not so much that the Bible has a literal declaration to kill witches, but that people aren't following it. Doesn't this, isn't this a bit hypocritical? How did they come to the conclusion? How did they reach this determination that it says this, but they don't have to follow it or something has changed? 
So there's going to be a conflict between quite often Old Testament and New Testament passages where some people just say, well, that's the Old Testament, and they want to shrug off the entire Old Testament. It's important to point out that you don't get to shrug off the entire Old Testament and keep the new. You can't have the new without the old. You don't have any prophecies that for Jesus to purportedly fulfill. You don't have the Ten Commandments. You don't have the various instructions. So if they want to just throw out parts of the Old Testament, they need to talk about what mechanism they use to determine which parts should go away. Quite often, the charge will come from Christians to say, well, you're taking that verse out of context. You know, when we talk about Exodus 21 and its advocation for slavery, oh, well, you're taking those verses out of context. Okay, fine. Instead of just saying, no, I'm not, perhaps it's a good idea to say, okay, what is the context? In what context is it a good idea to enslave people and make them your property? that you can pass on to your kids? In what context is it a good idea or is it okay to beat people as long as they don't die within a couple of days? I talked about a few examples earlier and, and I'm gonna give some specifics about that. The Bible does in fact condemn it, incest as I talked about in Leviticus 18.4 which you know basically talks about if you sleep with someone who's too close in kin to you, that's against the rules. But that passage doesn't really do a good job of defining what too close in kin means. I mean, is it just like brothers and sisters? Is it, you know, who, 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 do, how does this count? Well, if you read other verses, the Bible specifically goes through and tells you who in your family you should and shouldn't sleep with. I mean, it's spelled out and it's, it's weirdly specific. You know, you're not to sleep with your father's wife, whether or not that's your mother or not. Um, I guess perhaps we're looking back at old times where he might have had many wives and only one of them might have been your mother. But if the Bible's going to go through and spell out the individual cases of who you should and shouldn't sleep with, then it seems to me that instead of saying something incorrect, like the Bible does not prohibit incest, instead we should talk about the specific cases of incest that the Bible prohibits and the ones that it seems to implicitly be okay with. Because if you go to all the trouble to say, don't sleep with your sister, don't sleep with your first cousin, don't sleep with your father's wife. Wait a minute, does that mean I can sleep with my second cousin? Is that, is that where it becomes okay? Is that where we've drawn the line? These sorts of questions are the ones that we should be asking. When we talk about what the Bible literally says versus what it's intended to mean, we may not be able to figure out what it was intended to mean. We don't have the original authors to talk to. So the investigation becomes a search through context in other passages of the Bible. And there's some important things to know about how we should view things and how Christians have traditionally viewed things. The Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks hate groups and things, recently listed both Majid Nawaz and uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali as, I don't remember exactly what the category is, but, but labeled them as uh, hate speech with regard to Islam. They're wrong, um, in my estimation. Uh, is, is there hateful thought directed at Islam in general? Sure. Um, it's weird when you get into the online community, quite often there are people who will do the hashtag not all X. And some, on some occasions they'll get mocked. Basically, if we make a generalized statement about some group, somebody will point out it doesn't qualify to every member of that group. Well, of course it doesn't. And th this wasn't the presumption, but if there's a fair general criticism of uh, the tenets of Islam or something from the Quran or a uh, regime that has power that is implementing their version of this, I don't get to decide what a true Muslim is and what a true Muslim is. I don't get to decide what a true Christian is. I don't even get to decide what a true atheist, skeptic, or humanist is. But I do know that saying, ah, oh, well, they're not all bad, is focusing on the people and not the doctrines. And if I focus instead on the doctrines and the actions that some people take, I'm being fair and honest. And if somebody wants to call me a racist for that, okay, fine, too bad. Because I'm not looking at this in terms of race, I'm looking at it in terms of here's a doctrine, when implemented in this fashion, is dangerous and harmful and counterproductive. There, there are great people in almost any religion I can think of. And my point is they could be better 
if they dumped the religious baggage. And there are bad people in every religion that I could name, and they would be way better if they dumped the religious baggage. You're not concerned about truth. You've already just said you can pick and choose and toss aside the things you don't like, so you're inventing your own version of Christianity. So why not just chuck it aside and go ahead and invent your own secular moral system. You, you, you keep, on, keep talking about how we don't have limits. I have plenty of limits. And we live in a society that has plenty of limits. As Daryl's already pointed out, most societies have limits. You keep going to this slippery slope thing of, well, if there is no you know, Ten Commandments or Jesus or whatever, then you've got no limits. You'll just run around raping and killing people. Well, that's already demonstrably false. And there have been multiple studies that, that actually investigate the correlation between the religiosity of a society and its societal health. And there is always a strong negative correlation. The more atheistic the society, the better they score on societal health factors from everything from teenage pregnancy rates to STDs to happiness to wealth to, to murder, uh, murder rape. rape to um, uh, health care. Now, go out and do some actual research that contradicts this, and then you might have a case for your assertion that I think you'll live a better life if you're... No, you won't. There's no, there's, no there's no evidence to demonstrate this. This is wishful thinking. Just as you, Not only have you gone and said, well, I'll pick and choose what I want, you've done it in a way that where you're just trying to support your own wishful thinking. And until you actually come up with evidence, and until you demonstrate that you care about the truth, we don't really need to waste any more time on it. In, I was in Oakland for the Rapture Ram a few years ago. I don't know how many mm. people were there. The American Atheist Regional. Yeah, when we had an earthquake in the middle of the Rapture Ram. Which, <laughs> And it didn't change your mind. Yeah, my, my, my friend Keith Lowell Jensen talks about it all the time, about being in a room full of atheists when that happened. <laughs> uh, and I, w I was sitting there, and when it was over, because I'd never been in any kind of earthquake, and I'd been sitting there all day long, and I told Greta Christina and some of the other people who were there, I was like, I really hope we get an earthquake, and that happened. <laughs> and then while we're all sitting there and people are kind of, you know, recovering, I yelled, is that all you got? <laughs> So it seems like every other day, science, which I put in air quotes, has found God or found this. And, and people don't often go beyond the headline even, let alone to find out what the sources are. And I liken this to what I saw. I was a fundamentalist Christian for more than 25 years and, and thought that I was supposed to be a preacher. I read the Bible as a child, as a teenager. Um, and then other times as an adult as well. And I remember as I was finding my way out of religion, even though that's not what it felt like at the time, I was studying with the goal of trying to find a way to convince my atheist roommate that he needed Jesus so that we could be in heaven together. And I would read what atheists on some occasion would have to say about the Bible or what non-Christians would say about the Bible. And when I'd hear what they'd say, I'd say, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not right. I've read this. I've read it many times. I was in Sunday school. You're taking it out of context. You are missing some extra thing. And then I would find the more I studied, the more I began to realize that, no, it wasn't so much that non-believers were taking it out of context. It's I was putting it into a context that completely biased the way I read it. If, in fact, there is a God who is morally perfect, then when he orders the slaughter of the Midianites, well, that must have been a good thing. There's no way it was a bad thing. When, when he says that you can have slaves, there must have been some good reason for that. Certainly, a morally perfect being if slavery was actually wrong and this wasn't the case, would it, so you make all these excuses. And it, I don't know that it's that different when we're talking religion or politics or just in general what we believe about the world we inhabit. This, our biases impact everything. And I think the biggest fear I have is that, okay, I've discovered my biases that led me to these conclusions. So now I'm right. Now I'm free of bias, right? So I'm good. The same thing works in the, in the con artist field and, and with magic. If you know how people are deceived, you exploit that. And as soon as you think you can't be deceived, you are doomed. You're the one who is now in this position where, ah, I am the enlightened one 
I'm not going to fall prey to that again. And that almost guarantees that you're going to fall prey to 10 other things because you've blinded yourself to the possibility that you could be fooled. The other thing here is that Westboro's position is based on a literal reading of the Bible. And the, and the Christians who are okay with, their, you know, with homosexuals, their position is not based on anything in the Bible other than a kind of vague, oh, let's love everybody. And so the, it's the cherry-picking liberal the, the, theologies within Christianity um, that are generally, you know, kind to others, and they're okay with, you know, marriage equality and gay rights and things like that. But Westboro is not wrong. Their position is biblically sound. And this is what annoys me, is that we have people who recognize how, how immoral and horrific and inhuman this is, and instead of saying, hey, this couldn't possibly have come from the mind of God, I need to chuck this, they just ignore those particular verses, pick out some other verse so that they can re continue to cling to the religion that they've, they've grown fond of. When my concern is, number one, is it true? And number two, is it good? And I don't find that it's true, and I definitely don't find that it's good. And the only good things of it are things that human beings have done to manipulate it. They ignore specific teachings in order to make a new religion, give it the same label, so that they can feel more comfortable. They get the benefit of saying, oh, I'm a Christian, even though I don't believe any of the crap that's actually in the Bible. And that just drives me nuts. Just throw it all out. I'm going to close out here in a second, but I want to tell you something that I uh, actually just read right before here, and it, it's a in Poland um, today or yesterday, a 12-year-old uh, schoolgirl by the name of Maria Kislow was discovered hanging in her room by her mother when she went to read her a bedtime story, and her daughter had left a, mo a note that said, "Dear Mum." Please don't be sad. I just miss Daddy so much, I want to see him again. Her dad had died in 2009. This 12-year-old girl took her own life sometime this past few days so that she could go to heaven to be with her daddy again. And what the mother said uh, almost killed me if my heart hadn't already been partially broken. I, I, her mother said, this is so unbearable. If it weren't for the fact that my son was here, I would stop living right now too. Not all religion is the same. We don't want to paint religions with a broad brush. And I'm sure Jason and I have, have a conversation about uh, religion and, and evolution or religion and science and how much in conflict they are and we'd have to pause at the very beginning to say what do we mean by religion because religion isn't this monogamous thing or homogeneous thing ah, there we go use the right word dumbass it's uh, we can't paint with a massively broad brush but that little girl is one of the reasons that I do what I do that's one of the reasons why I think other people are wanting to get more involved. It's one of the reasons why I think we've seen so much, in, in, uh, our, our numbers increase so much in the secular movement and people wanting to get involved in arguing. So go ahead, argue. She can come up here. <laughs> go ahead, argue. Get in conversations, be outspoken, avoid. Please, please, please avoid the overreaching positions that shift the burden of proof making broad claims like, well, Jesus never existed. Might be true, might not be. It's not necessarily the best place to start, but there's no reason to go there. Don't run when they're not chasing you. Don't shift the burden of proof. Let them try to do it so that you can point out that they've done it. Oh, God's, are, God's an invented fiction, and, and uh, here's these various biblical interpretations and views that almost nobody holds, but I'm going to argue against them anyway. Ask the person what they believe and why. Get to know them. Engage. Be skeptical. Be reasonable. Have confidence in yourself, but doubt everything you believe. And question everything. 
Be compassionate. We were all worth it. Be honest. You don't know everything. You're not me. <laughs> and I don't know everything. Um, be caring towards people. Which doesn't mean that you, that you cannot be ruthless and relentless in attacking their positions as long as you do it honestly and surgically and are clear that on many occasions I have violated this rule. On the show I have said you're a moron. And what I mean by that is in this situation, on this subject, you are being moronic. And I don't look at it as an attack on that person's entire character. I realize they do, which is why I'm adding this little caveat and cautioning others. I realize that they do. My thing is we're all morons about something at some point. And it's a shorthand for me to say, oh, you're being a moron or you are a moron. And I'm trying to change some of that without getting any softer because religions by and large, at least the versions that I tend to speak out about, are vile and disgusting and harmful and poisoning the universe in which we live. And I will never, ever try to play nice about the actual ideas and the harm they do because that 12-year-old girl didn't need to die. Ridiculous ideas are by definition deserving of ridicule. Some people will take it personally. There's not always something you can do about that and still make the point. Because some of those people are offended that you and I even exist or that we won't sit quietly in the corner with our damn mouth shut. How dare you? I'm way over time, aren't I? Anyway, I was just like a lot of those people. I was a Rush Limbaugh, ditto head, fundamentalist Southern Baptist occasionally going to Pentecostal churches because that's where the good music was Bible thumping horribly backslidden couldn't care less about Christianity just like everybody else there's a vicious circle going on there and my thoughts were my own and I was able to find my way out despite religious indoctrination despite all of the fallacies, despite all of the pollution, and so can other people. And what they need is more voices. They need to get to know more atheists. They need to realize that half of the people that they know who they think are just, you know, maybe spiritual or whatever, they're atheists. The guy that's picking up your garbage and the guy that's operating on your heart, they're probably atheists. Actually, the more scientific careers, the, more, the higher educated the job is, the more likely that they're going to be atheists. That's, that's something we need to fix too, which is why I'm after the rednecks. Um, and, and I'm serious. I'm dead serious. That's my target. Fundamentalists, literalists, and rednecks because I'm tired of Jesus take the wheel if I turn on country radio. I want to hear something that's better than that. I want to be able to say, look, Taylor Swift doesn't believe because I'm, well, never mind. <sighs> Go out and argue and remember that you're dealing with people and that it's okay to go right after the argument but you might have put a little, you know, like butter on the wound afterwards and let them know that you're doing this because you actually care about them and about what kind of world you live in and what kind of world you leave behind. Thank you. The answer that I came up with, which is both honest and frustrates the crap out of theists, is I have no idea what would change my mind. I don't, and I find it a bit arrogant to presume that someone should think that I would have the capability of distinguishing a god from some amazingly advanced trickery. I don't know 